Turn to Deputy First Minister's office. We now move to questions to the Environment Minister, and of course we start with topical questions. Uh, Trevor Lunn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister if he could give us an update in terms of the establishment of the statutory transition committees so far? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was fortunately sitting close enough to Mr. Lund to hear the question. Uh, he was looking for an update on the, or the, the situation around the establishment of statutory transition committees. Now, uh, my predecessor issued guidance on the formation and nominations to the new STCs at the start of July. The recommendation for selecting nominees to be used was either De Haunt, Saint Lag, or single transferable vote. Importantly, this was to be based on the 2011 council election results and therefore reflect the, the democratic will of the, the communities that they were supposed to represent. It was deemed that guidelines would be more appropriate at this stage than regulations, as some of the voluntary transition committees went beyond the, the, the three methods um, I outlined there in order to accommodate power sharing and actually encourage good practice and, and, and fair representation. However, these guidelines have subsequently been ignored by a few councils. The, the vast majority have complied, but th those offending councils, Lisburn, Castlereagh, Balamone, Coleraine and Straban, they have also I suppose dismissed subsequent correspondence from myself on the issue. Trevor Lund. Yes, I thank the Minister for his, his answer, Mr Speaker. It does seem incredible that the body which, which produced the legislation, namely this body, to set up these new councils could not actually enforce a decent system of representation for the transition committees. But I understand that the Minister does not have the specific power to do that, either on any of the three systems he has, he has mentioned there. Does he, does he have any other way of putting pressure on these errant councils to, um, to, to, com to do the decent thing and produce proper representation? Okay, uh, thank you, Mr Lund. I have indeed sought further advice from officials and indeed legal advice on how we can resolve these irregularities, if you wish to call them that, and ensure that all councils comply and therefore that STCs can be properly constituted and get on with the very important business that, that, that they ought to be doing. I have also written to political party leaders urging them to speak to their colleagues on councils and emphasise to them the importance of displaying political maturity and putting the needs and democratic wishes of the electorate ahead of selfish party political needs. Alwyn McGuinness. Mr McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And could I take this opportunity of congratulating the Minister for his appointment uh, to the Department. Um, could I ask the Minister, in relation to the uh, statutory uh, transition committees, uh, has he received any correspondence from them uh, in relation to open competition for chief executives? Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. McGuinness. That was handy. It's on the same subject. <laughs> I have received a correspondence from two STCs and a number of councils on this subject, and as a result, I've written to all statutory transition committees and all councils to clarify uh, the position and address their concerns. My predecessor took the decision to use open competition to fill the new chief, chief executive posts, taking account of employment law, the compendium of principles, practice and guidance notes published by the Public Service Commission and OFM DFM, and legal advice which indicated that these were new posts. Some statutory transition committees and councils have concerns that current chief executives could claim for unfair dismissal if they are made redundant because of the decision on open competition. Legal advice confirmed that the current chief executives do not have a legal right to be considered for these posts in a closed pool. Therefore, a claim of unfair dismissal as a result of this decision is not defensible. 
Indeed, the position is quite the contrary. The new chief executive posts must be filled by open competition and in accordance with statute, as this is now legislated for in the statutory transition regulations which the Assembly passed on 2 July. Mr. McGuinness. Um, uh, could I thank the Minister for his answer? And, uh, uh, the Minister has indicated certain uh, legal reassurance to uh, uh, councils and statutory transition committees. Uh, but can he assure this House that, in fact, the advice that he has received and has given to councils is, in fact, something uh, that will be upheld? Thank you. Uh, the open recruitment for the new posts must proceed in accordance with statute. Statutory transition committee regulations now set in law that the recruitment has to be by open competition. As I have said, it would now be unlawful to use any other method. The only potential for legal challenge would be as a result of failure to adhere to the recruitment process itself. This process will be overseen by the Local Government Staff Commission and will meet all required employment, best practice and legal requirements. Independent assessors have also been appointed to ensure that the process meets these requirements. All STCs will be made aware of their responsibilities in relation to recruitment and panel members must uh, partake in compulsory training prior to sitting on any selection panels. Uh, could I ask the Minister, in the light of the Environment Forum last week, could he identify his, uh, his key policy priorities in the time ahead? Uh, thank, you. thank the member for the question, and I'll try my best to answer it. Uh, regrettably, I was unable to attend the Environmental Forum last week. I was actually at a, a pre-organised conference in Scotland on uh, climate change, which was very important. I, I met there with my Scottish counterpart, Paul Wheelhouse, MSP. <laughs> my, my footprints are big enough, as are, the, as, are, as are the footsteps I have to follow. Uh, However, I do have particular policies. I have had feedback from that forum, and I think it's a very important forum whereby they draw on experience and knowledge and opinion from across the North on a range of issues. My uh, policies would centre on different things. It's a very wide remit, as you're aware. I'm keen to increase further the speed at which planning applications are processed and hopefully approved and look forward to working with businesses and, and communities in order to achieve these results. I would like to reduce the amount of litter on our streets and the amount of waste we are sent into landfill by increasing recycling. I think what we have to do to do these things is to increase our engagement with the public to, in order to get them to uh, uh, take more respect and play a greater role in their own immediate environment and therefore on the wider environment as a whole. Like I had spoken, the conference I was at in Scotland was on climate change. Obviously, this presents us with huge problems as well, and is also a key priority of mine. Pat uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. And I'm glad to hear that he is. Uh, has as one of his key priorities the speeding up of planning approval. And I wonder, uh, and I, I would say that that has to be a, a key priority, particularly with strategic projects. And I wonder if he could update the House on the latest state of play in regard to planning approval for the three stadia in Belfast. Ella, yes, it is very important that we speed up the planning process. I said I'd like to speed up the process so much for approvals, but hopefully we can create a system where 
consensus can be reached be before an application is even submitted. This is a method that was actually applied in relation to the Stadia application in Belfast and has yielded differing results. Uh, uh, on one hand, you have Windsor Park, during which the pre-application community consultation flushed out quite a few problems and resulted in no objections when the application was made. Then you have Casement, which has quite publicly been subject to other objections. I have met with objectors to that project, and I, in the coming weeks, will meet with the Ulster Council, who are the proposers of that project. I'm very hopeful of getting an outcome that will be to the acceptance of, of both parties, and I, I'd like to do so quickly. Bartle McRae. Mr McRae. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, would the Minister accept that any decision about shale gas extraction should be based upon the best possible scientific evidence, but that if the evidence uh, was uh, satisfactory, it would have an extremely positive impact on our limited energy supply and indeed may help us with fuel poverty? Well, I would agree entirely with the first part <laughs> of Mr McRae's uh, question that any decision has to be fully based on evidence and fully based on science. And that is why I am determined to gather all the information, all the evidence that I can on hydraulic fracturing before making any decision on any application. And it must be restated that currently there are no applications for fracking here in the north. Uh, my officials through the NIEA are currently working with their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland in an attempt to gather as, as, as much information as possible, only not just on this island, but from across the world, where we can look at the experiences of other countries. Obviously, some of those are telling positive stories in terms of the alleviation of fuel poverty. However, I would have a concern that some of these victories, if you like, are very short term, and what we don't have is any evidence of the long term effects of hydraulic fracturing, both on the en environment or countryside, nor on people's health. Order, I'm, I'm very, very conscious, and I was very sympathetic to the member if he looks at the oral list of questions. The question that is asked and topical is very similar. Uh, so I'm saying to the member, order, 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 order. I mean, I'm going to allow the supplementary, but I'm going to listen. Well, I appreciate the direction from the speaker. Uh, I will just pick up on the point, Mr. Speaker, in response to the question from the Minister, where he agreed with me that scientific evidence would be the basis of his decision. And I just wondered, given that we have science at Stormont today in the Long Gallery, a lot of scientists, when the Minister would be in a position to have gathered such scientific evidence and when he might be minded to come and tell us what his conclusions are? Well, uh Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to give an answer to that. I will go back to my officials at the NIAEA. I will see how their research is going. Like I said, there is no application currently on my desk or anyone else's, for, for, I hope, <laughs> uh, for hydraulic fracturing. And when any application does come in, it will be subject to the full and rigorous planning process. Katrina uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister what reassurances can he give to councils and statutory transition committees that the DOE driven recruitment for senior officers process will not result in subsequent legal actions being taken against the STCs, the Statutory Transition uh, Commission, or the councils? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd probably give the same assurances as I had given Mr McGuinness a few, min few minutes ago uh, on, on the, the same thing. Uh, the position is quite the contrary. The new chief executive posts, and they're, they're the only posts that we're talking about here. I, I've given the directive already that those below chief executive level 
will actually not be subjected to, to open competition, but the new chief executive posts must be filled by open competition in accordance with statute, as this is now legislated for in the statutory transition regulations which the Assembly passed on 2 July. There is a further concern about the failure to consult current chief executives on the method of recruitment and the potential for redundancy. As the current chief executives have no automatic right to the new posts, there was no requirement to consult with them about the appointment procedure. There also seems to be the view that chief executives are being treated differently to other staff, as I have outlined, but this is not the case. The current chief executives will have the same statutory tupe type protections as all other local government staff. Members, that ends the period for topical uh, questions. We now move to all questions of the Minister of Environment, and I call Fry McCann. Minister McCann. I can call you a case over again. Question one. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Decisions on symbols and emblems are a matter for each district council, taking account of its duty under Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 and the Council's own equality scheme. My department has no legislative power to issue guidance on the matter, as it does not have responsibility for the policy on equality of opportunity. The major modernisation programme that will be implemented over the coming months to deliver our vision for strong, modern, community-focused local government provides a significant opportunity for elected representatives to address this issue respecting all sections of the community. The reorganisation of councils represents a new beginning for local government here. The new councils and the councillors need to provide civic leadership for the whole community within the local government district. I thank the Minister for uh, his response, but does the Minister not see a role for the proposed Commissioner of Complaints in dealing with many of these issues? I think that would be a very busy role. <laughs> Indeed, there, there is to be a Commissioner of Complaints. This is something that was uh, covered when we debated the Local Government Bill at its last stage on the 1st of October. And it will follow at the next stage, I'm sure, uh, the committee stage to this bill has been extended. And I'd say there will be quite a few amendments and at the next stage. This possibly will be one. However, this will be done more through regulation than through primary le legislation. The issue of uh, emblems is one that is very sensitive. It is also one that is very incendiary. And I think however it's handled, or whoever is handling it, it must be handled as such. Mervyn Storey. Mr. Storey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the concern that many seem to have in relation to the issue of equality and how everybody is treated fairly. Could the Minister maybe explain and tell the House on the current practice that exists in relation to local authorities and local councils, how many of those councils which are controlled by nationalists actually adhere to even designated days on the flying of the national flag in Northern Ireland? I unfortunately do not have that information to hand. However, I undertake to get back to the member in, in writing with specifics. This is precisely the kind of debate that I don't want uh, the local government bill, reform bill to get bogged down in, and why I therefore think that it is not the best vehicle through which we can deal with the flags issue. There are other fora set up to deal with such. There is the political reference group set up by my predecessor, Alex Atwood. And there's also the proposals from the First and Deputy First Minister, which are now the Haas talks and ongoing, and from which I would be hopeful of a positive outcome. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his answer, g particularly uh, given uh, the Minister's home patches where the leadership was shown uh, in terms of power sharing in Derry City Council uh, generations ago. Um, Mr. Uh, so, therefore, uh, therefore um, could I ask then, uh, Minister, uh, what protections uh, will mi minorities uh, be entitled to under the uh, reform of local government? 
Thank you. I uh, thank the member for her question, which I didn't write, despite the reference to the area. Uh, the local government bill that I introduced into the Assembly on the 23rd of September, and which passed second stage on the 1st of October, will introduce a system of checks and balances to protect the interests of minority communities in council decision making. The proposed governance arrangements will provide for the introduction of a call in procedure that would enable 15 per cent of the membership of a council – that is any six people in a 40-member council – to request the review of a decision in certain circumstances. It is proposed that a call-in would be used where the procedures used in reaching a decision are questioned or where there is an issue in relation to the protection of political minorities in the local government district. A further safeguard will be provided through the introduction of qualified majority voting or weighted majority voting for specific strategic council decisions, including decisions that have been the subject of a legitimate call-in. The support of 80 per cent of council members present and voting would be required for a decision to be agreed. The decisions that will require a qualified majority vote will be specified again in regulations and these will be subject to the draft affirmative procedure in the Assembly. Michael McGimsey. Mr. McGimsey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister agree that under the Belfast Agreement, Northern Ireland is a part of the Kingdom for as long as the people of Northern Ireland so determine, and that the only legitimate flag in terms of the constitutional settlement is the Union flag, and that that flag should therefore take precedent over all other flags? Mr. Speaker, I'm not uh, particularly sure of the relevance to, of that question to the uh, uh, original question. And as a Minister for the Environment, I'm much more concerned with raising standards than raising flags. Order, order, order. order. Tom Elliott. Mr. Elliott. Hey, question number two, Mr. Speaker. My officials in both DOE Planning and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency have previously met with representatives from Tamburan and their consultants. The most recent meeting took place on the 26th of June 2013. At that meeting, Tamburan's plans were outlined to drill a deep borehole to approximately 1,500 metres to obtain a core sample of the shale. It is my understanding that the purpose of the core sample is to determine the quantities of recoverable gas within the shale and that this will inform the commercial viability of Tamburan's project. As with previous meetings with Tamburan, my officials used this opportunity to reiterate that the Department of the Environment has a stringent suite of legislative, procedural and policy requirements that apply to such activities and that these will be robustly applied in the assessment of any planning or environmental related matters. In terms of the company's current exploration process, it was explained to Tamburan that there are certain permitted development rights not requiring planning permission for limited activity such as drilling boreholes or carrying out seismic surveys for a period of up to four months. However, it was explained that if the exploration works themselves are considered to require environmental impact assessment, the current legislation makes it clear that in such circumstances permitted development rights do not apply. My, depart my department has not yet received any applications received or related sorry, to this proposed project. However, it is my understanding that hydraulic fracturing will not form part of any initial proposal. Any future proposals involving hydraulic fracturing will be re required to carry out an environmental impact assessment. Tom Elliott. Mr Elliott. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and thank the Minister for that. And I note your, your direction earlier, Mr Speaker, to Mr McRae in relation to trying to steal my question, but I suppose that's nothing new for Mr McRae to try to steal something from me. But uh, could, I, could I follow up with the, the uh, Minister and ask him if he's had any discussions with uh, the Public Health Agency, either he or his officials, with the Public Health Agency in relation to hydraulic fracturing? Uh, discussions are ongoing with a range of people around hydraulic fracturing, a range of groups and organisations around hydraulic fracturing. To date, I have not met with PHA. I have met with 
like, as I said, quite a few groups, some of whom are opposed and one or two of whom are in support of hydraulic fracturing. I thank the, the member for the idea of meeting with the Public Health Agency and undertake to do so in the coming months. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Minister agree with me that whilst uh, the US economy has received a huge boost um, on the economy through fracking, we in Ireland and in the UK are very different uh, to the USA, which has a huge hinterland that they can explore frack, uh, uh, fracking. Uh, but here, any site we explore will be very close to urban areas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Ms. Lowe. I agree entirely with, with what Ms. Ms. Lowe has said. There, there, there have been benefits, albeit, in my opinion, short term, derived from hydraulic fracturing in the, the USA, but we are not blessed with the same, I suppose, geographical expanse of that area. There is a, a, a distinct difference, in my opinion, between the USA and Europe, and I think the way in which fracking is viewed in both, those, uh, both continents highlights that perfectly. Uh, th there is already huge opposition to fracking here in the north, despite the fact that, as I have said, there is currently no application. I can assure uh, Ms Lowe that any application that does come will be fully scrutinised and uh, rigorously upheld against planning policy and uh, will have to satisfy me or I presume whoever is the Environment Minister that it is 100 per cent safe and uh, both the people and, extremely importantly, the planet. Sammy Wilson. Mr Wilson. When the Minister took up his post, he was on record as saying that fracking would not happen on his watch. Given that some of these applications are likely Article 31 applications, is he saying he's already made his mind up, or might some of these happen on his watch, causing his green friends to see red at the promise that he has broken? Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> I think what I say is, is that this would, it would not happen on my watch easily. And I, I, I mean that well and truly. Any application, any application, or any decision, any decision will re require full scientific evidence. In my opinion, that scientific evidence is not there now. I can't see it being there in the foreseeable future. And therefore, I cannot see fracking happening on my watch. Mr. Fleming. Kian Corney, I thank the Minister for his answer. So, can I turn the question round? Would the Minister give us a categorical assurance that, in the absence of full scientific evidence proving that hydraulic fracturing is safe for animals, for people, and the wider environment, that he will not allow hydraulic fracturing to take place anywhere in the north of Ireland? In the absence of such evidence, I can categorically give the member that assurance now. That Paul Gibbon. Number three, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Police Service for Northern Ireland is responsible for the collection, recording, and compilation of road casualty statistics, and the daily road traffic fatality update is published on the PSNI's website. There have been 40 fatalities so far this year, compared with 32 at the same point last year and 44 at the same point in 2011. The most recent published factors that cause road deaths and serious injuries are for 2012. They were excessive speed having regard to the conditions, which resulted in eight deaths and 92 injuries, serious injuries, inattention or attention diverted, which resulted in five deaths and 73 serious injuries, and impaired by alcohol or drugs, driver or rider, which resulted in eight deaths and 59 serious injuries. These are typically the key causation factors every year. My department, 
within the framework of the road to zero road deaths is taking actions to address all of these issues, including recently the launch of a road safety campaign concerning the dangers of not wearing a seat belt. Mr. Speaker, clearly every fatality is something to be hugely regretted and the heartache that it brings to the families concerned. Uh, compared to this time five years ago, we have made tremendous progress in this respect, but obviously it will be concerning to the Minister that compared to this time last year, uh, the number of fatalities has increased. Uh, what assurances can he give to the House uh, that uh, there is a review of the communication strategy to ensure that that is effective and also that the PSNI target their resources uh, in the areas where fatalities often occur, which will be rural roads as opposed to motorways? I thank the member for his supplementary question. I think the member hit the nail on the head there. When, when we are speaking about statistics, so it is easy to forget that we are talking here about people who have lost their lives and families who have lost their young ones. Therefore, I take the issue of road safety extremely seriously and aim to build on the excellent work of previous, successive previous ministers in bringing down road deaths. Uh, th there are many ways which we can do this. Unfortunately, we have seen an increase this year. We have seen that something that causes me concern, an increase in the number of cyclists who have lost their lives this year. Therefore, I have already instructed officials and we are looking at how there can be a cyclist-specific add to our information campaign to increase their awareness and therefore reduce the likelihood of further accidents and fatalities. Even the advertising campaign I launched last week based on seatbelt wearing, this was fully based on evidence that despite a huge improvement in recent years in the number of people in the north wearing seatbelts, over the past year or so, we have seen more people not wearing them all the time. The advertising and the education and information campaign run by DOE has proven statistically to be extremely effective. It gets into people's heads, it stays in people's heads, and I have no doubt that it has played a major role and continues to play a major role in reducing the amount of people losing their lives on our roads. Is the Minister aware of research carried out by COT, Cooperation and Working Together, the health-based organisation, which points to a higher incidence of road traffic accidents in border areas? And uh, if so, uh, would the Minister undertake to take a careful look at this research to inform the strategy for border areas? I thank the member for his question. I personally was not aware of that research. However, there is work ongoing between my officials and our counterparts in the Republic of Ireland on this issue. Uh, one such piece of work will, I suppose, manifest itself in the coming months when I bring forward the Road Safety Traffic Amendments Bill Part 2, which will involve looking at mutual recognition of penalty points in both jurisdictions, uh, equalisation of drink driving limits in both jurisdictions. I think both of these uh, initiatives will play an important role in reducing the number of, of deaths on both sides of the border. John Dallet, Mr. Dallet. Uh, I, I am aware that the subject is difficult for the Minister, and he understands perhaps better than most people the impact that fatalities have on families. Is he satisfied that the cooperation between uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and the uh, Road Safety Authority in particular uh, is uh, maximised? I uh, thank the, the, the member for his question. I am content that the work being done between authorities on both sides of the border is good. I am content that it is beneficial. However, I am perhaps not content that it has been maximised. However, I do bring to this job a determination 
that the benefits of such a collaborative work is maximised and will do everything within my power to ensure that it is. While the environment is something that knows no borders as such, we share our air, we share our water and we share our roads. And I think collaboration be between myself and uh, my counterparts in the Republic is extremely important and something I will work hard on. Sean Rogers. Mr. Rogers. Before, Mr. Speaker. In Northern Ireland, the Eco Schools programme is operated by Tidy Northern Ireland, an environmental charity. It has grown from a baseline of 96 schools participating in April 2007 to 1,021 as at Friday, the 11th of October this year. This represents 85% of all schools in Northern Ireland. Eco Schools is a pupil led initiative and involves a whole school approach. Eco schools work through a simple seven step approach as they implement behavioural change within the school and continually reduce their environmental impact. There are three levels of Eco schools awards which schools can work towards. The awards criteria are closely linked to the seven steps. Schools can apply for bronze and silver award certificates, and the highest award takes the form of the internationally recognised Eco Schools Green Flag. The Eco Schools programme is one of continual reduction of the school's environmental impact. Therefore, the Green Flag Award requires renewal every two years. There are 10 topics for Eco Schools to choose from litter, waste, energy, transport, healthy living, school grounds, biodiversity, water, climate change and global perspectives. Schools are not expected to address all 10 topics, but would identify topics to be studied according to their own school's requirements. In order to achieve green flags, the green flag, schools are required to study one major and two minor topics. I have recently written to the 180 schools in the north still not involved in Eco Schools programme to encourage and join. 2014 will be the 20th anniversary of Eco Schools, and I hope that we are able to achieve 100% take up during the year. I would encourage all MLAs to look at the uptake of Eco Schools in their areas. And, oh. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I suppose on, on the 100% uptake, you have written to the, to the um, schools, but what else can be done by your department to maybe ensure that there is 100% uptake? Yes, I have written to the schools who haven't taken up or, or taken part in Eco Schools so far. Eco Schools is the world's largest education programme, operating in 55 countries and involving 13 million school children. More importantly, Eco Schools is demonstrating actively that economic benefits can result from improved environmental behaviours. For example, there are now two schools in Northern Ireland, that's Ulidia Integrated College in Carrick Fergus and Fairview Primary School in Ballyclare, that are sending no waste to landfill. This has come about as a direct outcome of work done through Eco Schools. To that effect, DOE Communications has developed a marketing communications plan to encourage the remaining 191 schools to join the programme. This is in tandem with work being done by the national operator, Tidy Northern Ireland, and their delivery partners. And like I was about to say before I ran out of time at the end of, of the last question, I would take this opportunity to encourage all MLAs to look at uptake in their areas and see in their own constituencies and see if they can somehow help and encourage schools to take part, and I'll certainly be to the fore in doing that, as I think FOIL has the worst uptake so far. Pam Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. The Eco Schools programme presents a good opportunity, obviously, for education and to promote young people um, in regard to environmental issues. And going forward, I believe this programme will work very well as we work towards a EU revised European <coughs> waste framework directive on prevention and reduction of waste. On that basis, could the Minister outline if his department um, will make additional funding available to further enhance the programme? I thank uh, Ms Brown for her question. Yes, 
this programme is extremely important in educating young people, and which in itself is extremely important. However, I think the real value of this is not only that it educates young people, that the young people go home and they educate their parents. I'm sure those of us with children will have been lectured by a child at some stage over what bin we put what rubbish in. And I think that's the beauty of this scheme and why it is yielding such good results. The current grant paid to Tidy Northern Ireland to deliver eco-schools is £85,000. This equates to 28 pence per pupil and is considerably lower than in other jurisdictions. In Scotland, it's, it's 60 pence. In Wales, it's 93 pence. And in the Republic of Ireland, it's actually £2.16. I will be looking at how perhaps more funding can be secured for this project, particularly as we come into the 20th anniversary year and are trying to push for more schools to take up on that. And I, I see a possibility may be existing around use of the money generated by the carrier bag levy as a possible way of doing so. David McNorry. Mr McNorry. Thank you, Speaker. I, I welcome the uh, uh, Minister's comments on funding. I think that is uh, richly deserved if it comes, comes about, as I do welcome his obvious enthusiasm for this scheme. Just taking it a step further, uh, are there any things in, being considered in his department uh, that might bring about additional incentives uh, for schools to participate and invest in. And for those that are already uh, involved in this, are there any greater rewards that might be uh, offered to them, say a super prize or something for the super school? Uh, I'm not all that keen on green flags, but in this case I am. Maybe a super green flag. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank uh, M Mr. McNary for his question. I think what we should do and are doing is going to have teachers and principals and children from schools who are currently in the programme to speak with those who aren't. There are benefits for schools, not just in terms of economic benefit, or sorry, environmental benefit, but also in terms of economic benefit. Bills have, or schools have seen their uh, energy bills go down as a direct result. I pointed to two schools who are now sending no waste to landfill and are therefore seeing savings. I am interested to, to, to look at how we can incentivise this and do believe in good, healthy competition, be it tidy schools, be it somehow else tidy streets. I, I, I think that is the kind of thing that we need to restore a civic pride in society and get our streets cleaned up again. I am currently taking stock of the planning bill and the amendments made at consideration stage. As members will be aware, there were two significant, complex and late amendments which introduced new clauses 4 and 15 to the planning bill. These clauses would allow OFMDFM to designate economically significant planning zones and limit the right to take a judicial review against the planning decision taken by OFMDFM the Department or, in future, the Councils. These amendments were the subject of concern of many members when we debated them in June. Like my predecessor, I am particularly concerned that the amendments are not within the legislative competence of the Assembly. The legal advice obtained by the previous Minister from one of the top QCs in the UK, who specialises in planning, environmental and public law, states that the amendment curtailing the rights to judicial review is not compatible with Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. The amendment would remove the right to seek judicial review in cases where decisions were made outside of legal powers or where the decision was plainly unreasonable. It is a long-standing legal convention that JR is an appropriate mechanism to challenge such decisions. Additionally, the Economically Significant Planning Zone Amendment does not contain exceptions for designated sites such as those under the Habitats Directive, and that could lead to infraction proceedings being taken against the UK. I also have a number of other concerns, and in taking stock, I believe it is important to listen to those parties who have an interest in the planning system. This is an important issue. We need to get the legislation right. 
is almost gone again. To that end, I have met and received representations from a range of key stakeholders. I have further meetings planned in the near future. Sure. And with a very quick supplementary. I, I appreciate, Mr. Speaker, that your, your predecessor in the House said that on those amendments there had been no consultation whatsoever. Can the bill go forward on that basis? <clears throat> I believe the, that both the amendments we're talking about here are significant and should be subject to full and rigorous public consultation to gauge the views of the public and key stakeholders. I'm also concerned that the Environment Committee was not given the opportunity to properly scrutinise the amendments. I find that fact extremely disappointing, especially as they weren't drafted overnight and the members who brought them forward at the last moment both sit on the committee and had ample opportunity to bring them forward for discussion with their colleagues. Order members that answer questions to the environment.